Welcome to the Bucket List Life Podcast with Trav Bell, the world's number one bucket list expert. Bucket List Life's mission is to help you get off the treadmill, stop Groundhog Days, hack your habits, and live a regret-free life. Because we know life's way too short not to live your bucket list life. So please welcome your host, Trav Bell, the Bucket List Guy. Hey, Bucket Listers, welcome to another episode of the Bucket List Life podcast. And I am so stoked that we've got Tenya Armstrong, the CEO of the Classroom of Hope on today. How are you, Tenya? Hey, Trav. Thanks for having me. Excellent. Where are you about? Whereabouts are you in the world right now? I'm in Bali, Indonesia. Most of our work is here in Indonesia right now. So I'm lucky enough to be able to live here. Oh, damn. What do you, so when you're going into a country, what do you put on your incoming passenger card as your occupation? Well, right now it's CEO, which is new for me. I, di- I always said I didn't want to be a CEO, never wanted to be a CEO, but here I am. <laughs> how'd, you wind, how'd you wind up in that, in that position? And why didn't you want to be a CEO and why did you take the role? Yeah, well, God, that's a big question. Long story there. Uh, My background is in housing and homelessness, social housing in Melbourne and um, worked in that space for a long time in pretty senior leadership roles and was probably ready to take the next step to a CEO role around 10 years ago. And I guess life circumstances at that time prevented me from doing that. And yeah, so then I was just in senior roles and during COVID... It was a particularly difficult time, particularly in Melbourne with all the lockdowns and in homelessness in particular, the Victorian government were fantastic and they funded a whole lot of hotel rooms for people experiencing homelessness or people who were rock sleeping or sleeping in their cars. We ended up with thousands of people who had histories or were experiencing homelessness in hotels in the CBD. So it was a crazy time. I had 300 staff through Metro Melbourne, all who were dealing with their own challenges of COVID and having to working you know in a service industry a really important service industry and it was just a really crazy time it's hard enough just it was hard enough just having a house let alone being homeless what was that entity what was that company that you worked for i was working at launch housing they're a big homelessness agency in melbourne working they've got 14 offices throughout metro melbourne yeah and i was homeschooling two children at the same time as working a a massive full-time job and yeah i guess at the end of that i was ready for a break i was ready to do something different the girls and i had had a map of the world on our wall during COVID. we really missed traveling we were like where are we going to go where in the world are we going to go when this is all over and we talked about having a year in italy or doing something like that um but that all proved too difficult and i had this opportunity to uh stay in a friend's villa in bali he said why don't you just start there have a have a break and so i thought wow that's a chance meeting and quit my job packed our bags and eight weeks later we moved to bali i look backstory and we've obviously had a chat we met at the business benchmark group recently you did your keynote i did my keynote we raised what is it 100 and how, how much was raised at that event it was crazy yeah it's one hundred and thirty thousand dollars right now i think so Unbelievable. Uh, that's unbelievable. You know, the power of that room was unbelievable. A total bucket list, you know, to bucket list kind of event. It was um, a lot of people now contributed to building schools. And we'll circle back to that. But, you know, we sat, to, sat together, we hung out, we had a conversation and we knew each other from sort of past lives or we're kind of ships in the night. We're both from, you know, Yarraville. You lived in Yarraville. I lived in Yarraville. And I, you told me a story about your, your partner um, do you want to elaborate on that? And that, that's obviously led you to, you know, doing what you do now. Yeah. So in 2014, my husband took his own life. Very suddenly, not expected. I had a one-year-old, a six-year-old and a one-year-old at the time. So it was just unbelievably difficult. I mean, he had had depression all his adult life, really, but had always it very well and I just never thought he would do that and neither did his friends had been successful in a business in many business actually quite entrepreneurial and just one moment of madness he yeah I think I said to the room at the business benchmark group because on reflection I feel like he felt like a burden on his family um because of no. mental health. so yeah I said to that room of young men incredibly inspiring young men in that room that day 200 of them 
if you have poor mental health, you're not a burden on your family. If you take your own life, that's a big burden for your family to carry. So, yeah, it's been a really difficult time. It took us at least five years or it took me at least five years of getting back on my feet. Lots of support from my sister in particular. That lots yeah. Of, yes. And so, so sad to you. Yeah, I guess it changes your perspective and it changes the way I I live my life now, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. And, and there was no signs, you know, no signs of it. Well, other than that, he did have depression. He had diagnosed depression and had had it for yeah, a long yeah. time and yeah. used medication on and off over the years. But no, he went to his normal Friday night, couple of beers at the pub with his mates and never came home. Yeah, wow. Wow. So sorry to hear that. No, it's so hard uh, suddenly having to, re, you know, <laughs> reconfigure life and with your girls and everything. It, it, and after obviously the acute phase, and obviously there's, I bring this up, you know, not to, not certainly not to harp on it, but to send a message to anyone listening, watching this right now. And it goes out through all, all of my channels, of course. But you know, I speak a lot about mental health, having been through depression myself, albeit you know not at that level. And there's just too many, you know, all too encompassing, full on stories about mental health. And the more work that I do as the bucket list guy, the more stages that I stand on, the more audience members are getting up and sharing their stories. Let alone, you know, people leaders such as yourself. So if, if you're hearing this right now, what would you say, Tanya? If you're hearing this right now and you're going through a, a bit of a tough time, a bit of a battle, you know, mental health struggles, what would you recommend? Oh, look, the, the, the messaging is always reach out and talk to someone. But I know for someone struggling with their mental health, that's always a really difficult thing. But I think it's, it, yeah, I really, the more I've learned about suicide since my husband died, there seems to be this overwhelming feeling that they are a burden either on their family, on their community, on their workplace, on society because they are not at the best version of themselves at that time. And so I, I just really think that's something that we as a society have to listen to. 100%. So you're not a burden, you are loved and you deserve to be here and you have no idea how powerful you are and what an influencer you are to um, all those around you. So let's go to a lighter note. It took you a while to get over that and then you moved to Bali. What made you say yes to this role as CEO? You were hanging out in Bali and then what did someone just come up to you, a friend of yours, just come up to you and say, hey, do you want to be CEO or do you have to apply for this position? Were you re recommended for this position? You know, what was that process? Well, I was in Bali. I quit my job in Melbourne actually at Launch Housing. Launch sort of said to me, no, you don't need to quit. We'll hold your job. You know, go and have your adventure with the kids, have your break and we'll hold your job and you can come back and be a part of the launch family again. But the longer we stayed in Bali, like my kids loved it immediately. I had my, they, the girls were 14 and nine at the time. Great age. Yeah. Yeah. My 14. And that was part of the reason for, for wanting to have an adventure because my daughter was entering year nine. It's that classic non-academic year in Australia. I thought if we're ever going to have an adventure, now's the time. And she said to me, you're ruining my life. I can't believe you're doing that. I hate you. <laughs> um, and now she's living her best life, of course. You know, we have an amazing yeah, yeah, life. Yeah. And you're trying not to say, I told you so. Yeah, yeah, well, I have. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, we were here for six months, meant to be here for nine months. I sort of got to that period and thought, I've got to find a reason to stay. We loved it. The girls were at the international school here in Changu and they loved the school. We're having a great time, great friends, great education. And I started researching what can I do to, you know, stay in Bali and have a, a longer time here. And I came across Classroom of Hope and their online presence was incredible. You know, this organization that was not only building schools and giving education to kids have access to education, but they were doing it in an environmentally sustainable way. And I knew that if I was moving out of housing and homelessness, I wanted to move into environment. I thought I could use my skills like them kind of transferable skills into an NGO in that space. So, yeah, I pretty much stalked the CEO, then CEO online. Um, Professionally stalked, of course. That's, yeah. that's what, what we say now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a pretty small world here in Bali. And he and his <laughs> wife, Nicola, who are the co-founders of um, Classroom of Hope, Duncan Ward and Nicola Corton, I asked him to have a coffee with me and it just turned out to be one of those meetings whereby he was ready to step out of the CEO role. He was ready to do something different. He, he built the organization from 
10 years and and I was ready for a change and so I just started working a bit punting my time with him you know learning about it it kind of came to the time when he stepped aside from the CEO role and the board undertook a process um, recruitment process and yeah here I am wow when did they start it when they found it they founded the organization. Oh, Duncan's got a, a, you know, his own story. He lost his brother suddenly and went on, was working in corporate in Western Australia and was feeling a bit disillusioned with the corporate world. Went on a trip to Cambodia, met a, ma- a chance meeting with a man called Raki who, you know, survived the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia, had an incredible childhood whereby he was separated from his family. But Despite all the challenges, he managed to get himself educated to a university level. And Duncan was so inspired by this guy that they talked about giving back and giving opportunity for education to Cambodian children in remote and rural areas there. So that's kind of how it started 10 years ago. And I mean, Racky's still kind of the heart and soul of the organisation and, and still inspires us every day. We're still building schools in Cambodia but right now our focus is on this block school 100% recycle to build school. Oh, let's get into that right. let's get into that uh, so tell me what is a block school this is what's fascinating it's not about just building schools ladies and gentlemen this is about taking like recycling plastic of which there's a fair bit hanging around Bali let's be honest yeah Indonesia and I think Indonesia is second only to China in its really generation of plastic waste every day yeah. Wow. So tick, tick, tick. We're, we're getting plastic out of the ocean, number one. We're recycling it, number two. Then we're building schools and we're educating kids. What's not liked? What's not good? <laughs> Where's the negative? It's so much, you know, so many great big ticks there. So how does that process work? So, well, I guess the, the missing part there is in 2018, Lombok in Indonesia was struck by a series of earthquakes that devastated the whole island, whole north of the island. Biggest ever earthquakes in Lombok. And over 500 people lost their lives. And it wasn't the earthquake that killed people, it's the buildings falling down on them. And so ah, right. yep. Classroom of Hope was part of the immediate disaster relief efforts then. And they were rebuilding pop-up schools, just like, pretty much a tin shed to get kids back into education as quickly as possible because they were all so traumatised by the earthquake. But it was Duncan, uh, our founder at that time, that went, you know, this is crazy, we're, we're building back and the same thing's going to happen again and these kids are so scared to go inside a brick building because they've seen what happens. How, and so it was actually during the pandemic that he researched the world to find an earthquake-resistant product. And wow. he... Wow looked at multiple different products but the block solutions product which is what we're building with now stood out to him and it was that silver lining about being recycled plastic as well like it just ticked so many boxes so are they indo based are they indo based um the block schools project yeah oh, block the the blocks the building blocks are they yeah indonesian company no, well, yes and no. It's a Finnish-based invention. So Block Solutions' okay. original company is Finnish, endorsed by the UN for the product. Uh, uh, the inventor worked with the UN in developing the product. So, and again, he's licensed Block Solutions throughout the world now. It's it's available in um, Africa, South Africa, Egypt, Saudi Arabia. Just been endorsed in the US and here in Southeast Asia. Yeah, it's. The factory has been built in Lombok, so it's Indonesia's recycled waste, which makes it incredibly important for the local community. Do they build more than just the schools for you guys that builds a lot of other stuff? Well, we buy the blocks from Block Solutions and we've built homes as well. You can basically build any modular structure. It's a modular yeah, building yeah. methodology. Fantastic. Fantastic. So what do they, is it a recycling plant? Do they take, how does the rubbish how does the recycling get to the plant? It's a long process. Uh, there's many people involved. So there's the pickers who pick it out of the rivers and the ocean or um, collect it from trash bins. It goes to the dump and it's sorted there. And then, you know, Indonesia's 
waste management systems are pretty unsophisticated in comparison to the working world? Or, or yeah, that's where I'm going with this question. Is like <laughs> this. Uh, Got to be systemised this because uh, it's pretty shocking at the moment. That's right. I mean, look at Australia; it's not doing so well itself. But um, you know, there's there's recycling plants on in Surabaya, which is where the plastic goes to, which is where the it's washed, palletized, and sorted, and everything, and then it's shipped back to Lombok to make the blocks. It's an injection moulding machine to make the blocks. Yeah, and a lot of the ben- business benchmark crew that have been involved. Uh, Stefan, of course, uh, the founder. They've been over there. They've they've seen, got amongst it, seen the blocks. I can't wait to get over there as well to see how this whole process. It's a fascinating process, right? So, how long does it take to to build these blocks? And do you do do you build do you build them based on the project, or you just have a heap of blocks sort of hanging around, and then you build the project? Well, we buy the blocks as we need them. But right okay. now, we work very closely with the Lombok local government on rebuilding Quaker for so. Our field offices have got like 100 schools on the wrist right now, which is around 300 more classrooms. We've already built 52 block classrooms, but we know there's still a high need. Five years after the earthquake, kids are still learning in poor learning conditions or, you know, out in the open or in buildings that get flooded in the wet season and are hot in the dry season. Yeah, but definitely come over. It's an incredible experience to be there on the ground. It never gets old being there. The kids are so grateful. They say they prefer to learn in a block classroom now because they're still scared. Like we were there in August actually with Stefan and the business group and there was a small earthquake then and it frightened all of us because we know the history but for the people of Lombok that were there in the time when the earth, the big earthquake struck, I mean, they didn't go into buildings for days afterwards, just this small tremor. They're so frightened and so many of the buildings are in walls. But the kids say, oh, we want to be in the block classroom because we know it won't <laughs> if, if it falls down. How the hell do you test to say that something's earthquake proof? <laughs> That's um... Block solutions have done the really sophisticated seismic test. Yeah. yeah, so, I mean, yeah, wow. it's, it's certified earthquake resistant now, so. Is it, there's even a certification? Yeah. <laughs> wow, there you go. I don't, I don't think my house here would be uh, certified, but um, so double bonus, guys. You can, go and, um, you can go and have a look at the earthquake resistant schools and, and get amongst the manufacturing process and see how the blocks are made, the recycling process. And for the surfers, who I know there's a lot on this database, who this goes out to and the subscribers of this podcast, I know that a lot of you surf too. So there's two real big, <laughs> big selling points of Lombok right now, apart from it being an amazing place and um, getting amongst classroom of hope. And how much does it take to build a school then what is what does that look like and how many classrooms in a school typical school typically around three classrooms are needed in each school some of the bricks and mortar buildings stood up in the earthquake so we add to those to give you know the because sometimes there's hundreds of kids learning in two classrooms but we work with the school community we work with the local government they're public schools so the government donates the land that we build on um, okay. and they provide the teaching staff so that's kind of and the ongoing sustainability of our program there. They they provide all the operational um, needs for the school ongoing. So once we've poured the concrete slab, the classrooms go up in literally a week. Like the walls go up in a day or two. Um, These things are built in a week. Yeah, like the blocks are literally like adult Lego. They slot together like... <laughs> I mean, check out some of the videos on our website. It really yeah, is... In, yeah, in a week you can have a classroom built once you've got the slab you know aluminium doors roof we put we fully furnish them and plumbing and everything that's all done there's toilets and electrical we build toilets as well many of the schools haven't sanit- good sanitary facilities they were demolished in the earthquake or damaged heavily and you know, a lot of the time that means going to the bathroom in the river behind the school or in front of the school or wherever or going home and not coming back to school so we build toilets now as part of the the school rebuilds and they're just the same like block toilets in two or four blocks depending on how many kids at school hand washing stations we give them education programs around sanitation improved sanitation so Um, good yeah so good and yeah you can have kids literally back in the classroom within two weeks how good is that so how many kids would you say would be in a classroom of which there's what three to five classrooms per school 
Yeah, around that. Some are smaller. These are very remote and rural areas. Sometimes you can only get materials up to the school by motorbike. You can't even get a car up there. It's, right, right. It's the jungle in some instances. On average, how many kids would be in a classroom up there? Classrooms we build, we furnish with 20 to 25 desks, so around about that. But prior to Prior to us adding classrooms, there might be 70, 80 kids learning and all different ages and different learning groups. So we're aiming to to give kids a quality education and that means Western class sizes and class groups learning at the same level. Yeah, so it's around about 22,000 Australian dollars for a fully furnished classroom with desks, chairs, whiteboard, fans, electricity, everything. So good. And a typical school is what, 100K? Around about, yeah. So 100K is around four or five classrooms and four toilets, and that might be 150 kids. Wow. Wow. So there you go, guys. So if giving back, let's let's reflect on your bucket list right now. You know, kind acts for others, leave a legacy. If this is something that, like, I've actually got on my bucket list tenure, I've got build a school and build a hospital. Oh, wow. Before yeah. you met me. Yep. And... That I put those on the list after I visited an orphanage in Cambodia out back at Phnom Penh. And I spent some time out there and they gave me the, the rundown of how much it takes to build a, build a school, build a hospital, fully functioning. And uh, I just went, yeah, what? that's on my live a legacy right there. So I'll, uh, yeah, put the, put the coin together and uh, maybe get some mates involved and, and off we go. So... It's um there you go there you go guys so you got a you know hundred hundred grand if you've got a hundred grand spare if not more then we can literally get a, a school built and can a person put their name on the school because they want to be proud of it or their business name of course yeah we always acknowledge the donors and we've had some incredible people do fundraising events and build a school like people have done marathons or other extreme sports events and raised money. Um, or heaps of different things that we've got an amaze wall on our website that showcases all the people that have raised funds and built a school over. There. So good, so good. And how's your fundraising schedule? What does that look like for a person in the, the CEO position? And you know, are you constantly going to these uh, fancy events and you know around the world? And you know, because a lot of the especially around the bushfire period here in Australia a few years ago when we had those tra- you know really crazy bushfires that were seen all around the world this thing came up that I've never heard of before and it was literally called charity fatigue you know or compassion fatigue because and I'm sure you would have faced this and I know a lot of other people who founded charities and, and whatnot you know often refer to this is whenever there's a you know whenever something goes wrong there's always a new, you know, Kickstarter campaign or GoFundMe pages that seemingly, you know, everyone's, uh, I mean, you got something so unique. It's so cool. I'm not, not throwing that in with everything else. It's just, I've heard this term compassion fatigue or, or charity fatigue. Everyone's asking for money. And how do you, you know, how do you get around that? I, I know I could probably answer for you, but you know, how do you get around that? And if you've ever come across it, if it's ever been a, a barrier, Well, I think Classroom of Hope was built on really solid personal relationships and it was those people who were the original funders, so we call them wise owls or principals, and they've continued to give year in, year out to support our operation. And that means we can deliver everything we raise into the field to build schools or homes or toilets or whatever it is. So Duncan had an incredible supporter base that's always supported vision. But yeah, I mean, giving fatigue is real and something like what's happening in Gaza and Palestine right now is probably making it more difficult to fundraise. But no, I don't go around the world to these fancy events. That's an unusual thing for me to do. But Business Benchmark Group are an incredible organisation that take their corporate social responsibility really seriously. And I hope that Stefan inspires many other big businesses to give back from a corporate perspective. And, you know, I think now us having an environmentally friendly way to build, that gives businesses the opportunity to, you know, whether they want to offset their carbon emissions or if they want to, if they're big producers of plastic, they can, you know, fund schools made out of recycled plastic to offset that they produce. So 
I think that's the target of some of our fundraising in the future is big corporates who are big generators of plastic. Yeah, yeah, going for the two big ticks there is the green ticker, which is obviously a big one, and the giving back social responsibility tick. It's so cool. What's been your impact so far? How many kids have, you know, are you starting, What one question I've got is, are you starting like new schools on new land or simply replacing the ones that have collapsed? In Cambodia, we're building new schools that haven't existed before. We're still building using traditional building materials in Cambodia, but we hope in 2024 to be able to build block schools there as well. But in Lombok, it really is rebuilding after the So it's existing public schools that had their facility damaged or destroyed by the earthquake. So, I mean, if we finish this program in Lombok, we will have built 350 classrooms. Um, wow created an impact today for 21,000 children, but given the blocks are certified to last up to 100 years. Because it's Very plastic. cool. Um, you know, you can't... Like beyond 100 years, these blocks? Well, they're, they're certified up to 100 years if you maintain them, and it depends on the climate they're in, they're in if they're in direct sunlight, just like any product. It, but, you know, we see plastic doesn't break down. <laughs> it's 100 years recycled plastic so it's it's generational transformation in north lombok really if we finish the program or not if when we finish the program there thousands and thousands of children for generations to come it's incredible what does finish the project look like x number of schools or you know for that region is that what you're saying yes so that would mean rebuilding every single earthquake damaged classroom in north lombok and East Lombok some as well. And, you know, the the program, our field officers are out there on the ground. They're constantly assessing what the needs are. Right now we've got 303 classrooms on our list, so we just chip in and um, Unreal. hopefully out to other Indonesian islands like, you know, the surfing spots like Nias and Roti and Sumba and all these islands, there's kids not going to school. So it'd be cool to build some block classrooms out there as well. Oh, that's so good. So good. And having spent a fair bit of time over there surfing and, uh, you know, on some of the Mentawi Islands and, yeah, you just see where kids are at and, you know, malaria as well, running rampant, probably not as big a problem as it was. But, you know, uh, what you're doing is contributing to, uh, you know, kids surviving a hell of a lot longer too. So health and education, right? Yeah, that's right. And, uh, you know, organisations like Surf Aid, which are an Australian charity, they're doing some amazing work in Sumba right now on that healthcare side and nutrition and, you know, there's lots of stunting in young children for nutrition. So, you know, we want to partner with those organisations and have a real impact. It's not just education, actually nutrition and healthcare, eyesight and good teeth and all of those things that enable a child to thrive. So, yeah, we're just looking to partner with organisations where we can do what we do best, they do what they do best, yeah, make a greater impact. Hey, look, on a, on a personal note, how's Bali life? Switching from Melbourne, I think everyone escaped Melbourne after COVID. Has it moved up to Queensland or moved down to where I am here in Ocean Grove, about an hour and a half? Everything got more expensive on the coast, but everyone couldn't escape Melbourne fast enough. How's Changu life? How's Bali life for you and the kids? Bali life's great. We were in this total honeymoon period for the first 18 months. We just absolutely loved it. And the girls, are they love the school here. They've made great friends, great expat community. But like those surf coast towns where you live, there was a massive influx of expats here too, which has pushed the prices up. Bali is kind of not the cheap place it once was, but it's an amazing lifestyle, great people. Yeah, we love it. We love it. Not without its challenges, of course. We have our bad days. Traffic, but you are drinking a you know coconut, fresh coconut every morning. I'm right. Am I right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's an island paradise, that's for sure. Yeah, I love it. We've got uh, just a couple of other quick questions. Obviously, bucket list life podcast here, and so stoked that you could be on Tanya. You obviously saw my presentation. You know what a reverse bucket list is. You know what a future bucket list. I'd like to just explore what are your top three reverse bucket list items, um, you know, your done list so far. Well, I think living in Bali is is one right now where I'm kind of living, I'm living the bucket list. So I always had a dream to live in Bali and here I am. I think meeting my son who's now 24 with the girls in Europe in 2019 was we had a month through Spain and Portugal just the four of us which was just awesome. an amazing family 
Um, what else? The reverse bucket list. I think I wrote down when I was with you, like skydiving and bungee jumping and, and those sorts of things. Yeah, I think living in Bali is living the dream right now. That's the bucket list life. What about the future bucket list? Three things. I know you had a big list next to me. I looked down and it was pretty extensive and it had Italy written in it somewhere. So what's the top three, if not more, you know, future bucket list items for you? Well, spending at least a month in Italy is number one on the bucket list. And, you know, having that session with you in Melbourne a couple of weeks ago, it just made me think, just do it. Like, what are you waiting for? So that's definitely going to happen for all of July next year. I'm uh, getting my sister excited about that one so she can join us there with the kids. Um, definitely Italy. I'm learning Indonesian. I stopped for a while. I definitely want to become fluent in Indonesian. I need it for work, but I just want personally to be able to speak Indonesian. Um, and the girls, the girls are both learning it. It's also they will help. Lots, <laughs> yeah, lots of travel things on my bucket list, I guess. If, lots of places I want to go to in the world, lots of things I want to do from a health perspective. Yeah, and, you know, I started to say it out loud that for me now I don't want to be single anymore, so I'm kind of ready for that chapter in my life. So that's on my bucket list is to meet someone I'm going to grow old with. There you go. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we've heard it all there. Put it out there. <laughs> You're saying it out loud. I love that. <laughs> Not just saying it to ourselves anymore, we're saying it out loud. No, nah, that's awesome. Uh, that's awesome. And uh, hopefully, guys, that's given you some ideas. You know, look at um, how can we donate, Tanya? If we want to we want to build our school, how do we donate? How do we contribute at least some to it? Yeah, well, you can jump on our website and donate anytime. You can become part of our Block Monthly Givers program, which buys blocks every month that contribute to a school. You can set up your own fundraising page and inspire your own personal community to donate through an event or a, some crazy sporting activity <laughs> love that love that and we just go to how do we connect to that yeah classroomofhope.org is our website classroomofhope.org and it's got a big donate button there and and uh it's a really user-friendly platform as well tanya armstrong so cool to hang out once again and um I'm sure we'll share the stage soon and I'm sure I'm sure that a lot of bucket listers who listen and watch this will be inspired. Please go to the website classroomofhope.org, ask whatever questions you need to ask of Tanya if she's an open book. They're doing some amazing work as you've just heard. Whether it's a little bit or a lot, totally up to you, but it certainly, you know, ticks the legacy, you know, bucket list part of it and also the kind acts for others. Um so, uh, and if you're over, ever over in Lombok, yeah, go hang out and see what they're doing on the ground because it is uh, absolutely fascinating. And uh, I don't know that personally yet, but I'll be over there soon. But I know, you know, Stefan and his team and all the people that went over and visited certainly had an amazing experience. So thanks, Eve Tanya. Thanks for being on the show. Thanks so much for listening to the Bucket List Life podcast with the world's number one bucket list expert, Trav Bell. For more great content, go to www.thebucketlistguy.com. We'll see you next time.